Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Chess Talk. My name's Johnny Cocaine and you're joining me from my flat in Edinburgh, where I have to say the weather outside is pretty spectacular today. Um, it's great to see people um, returning. If this is your first ever Chess Talk, welcome. If you've been to one of our talks before, even better. We hope you enjoy today's talk. And of course, there are many ways you can follow us. The best way to stay involved is through the Zoom platform, because you can ask me questions directly through the chat function. As always, that chat function is on private, so I'm the only one that can see your questions. So don't be afraid, you can ask any question you like, and I'll do my best to try and answer it. You can also follow us streaming live on YouTube and also on our Instagram page. And a, a big shout out as always to Cal Norville, who's our social media expert, and she's responsible for the online streaming. So Cal, thanks for all the good work you're doing. And I hope your stream is working well because we've got some video clips today. You can also find out some information about our online courses at our CS website at www.cs-schools.com. There's lots of information about how we're going virtual going forward. And um, hopefully you can find all the information you look for there. Okay. So if you'd like to catch up on any of our previous chess talks, they can all be found on our YouTube page. There are five of them up there already, and there'll be more added as we go on throughout the summer. So you can look at topics as varied as biscuits, pub culture, music, food, and just last week, we did the lion and the unicorn. But this week, um, what I want to do is take a page out of our London principal, David Morgan's book, and speak to you about a type of sport. And David spoke to you about tennis. But what I'm going to do is start by showing you four different sports, football, golf, baseball, and cricket. I'm going to ask you what you think connects all of those sports. Now, maybe one of the obvious answers is that they all use balls, and that would be absolutely right. These sports have all also appeared in the Olympic Games at some time or another, although thankfully they quickly removed cricket. But the connection I'm looking for is that each of these four sports originated in the United Kingdom. Yes, even baseball, absolutely synonymous with America, originally started off as a British sport. And I'm going to show you three other sports that are maybe a little bit more unusual that started in Britain. How many of them do you recognize? Here we have darts, very popular in pubs. Here we have curling, very popular in Scotland, played on frozen rinks. And finally, we have this, extreme ironing, very popular among students who have had slightly too much to drink. Yes, Britain has really been the birthplace of many sports over the years, and there's one particular reason for that. When we first invent the sports, we're very good because no one else knows the rules. After a few years, when people learn how to play them, they always end up being better than us. So we need to invent a new sport in order to keep on winning. But I'm not going to look at any of these seven sports today. Instead, the sport I'm going to look at is one that I played quite a lot when I was younger. And in case you're wondering, this is me here, one of the few photos that exist where I don't have a beard. It's a sport I coached for a number of years and a sport I currently referee. Yes, the sport I want to look at today is rugby. And maybe some of you have never seen rugby before. So what I thought I'd do is start off with a quick 30 second clip to let you see what this sport is all about.
it. That's what rugby looks like. But um, what is it and how is it played? Well, like most outdoor ball sports, it's played on a grass pitch. And in rugby, we've got two posts at either end, which look a little bit like H's. What is it? Well, if you were listen to listen to Oscar Wilde, he said rugby is an occasion for keeping 30 bullies far from the center of the city. I think it's safe to say that Oscar Wilde was not a fan of the sport. He is at least partly right, because there are 30 people on the pitch. Rugby is played with 15 people on either side. And the main ambition is to take the ball and run it from your half into the opposition's end, scoring when you reach the far point. And have a look at that ball itself. This is how you can tell this sport was invented in England, because who else but an Englishman could invent the oval ball? So very brief overview of rugby there. Let's have a look at the history. Where did it come from? How did we invent such a sport? Well, in order to look at the history, we need to look at this particular town in England, and we need to look at this particular gentleman. This town, appropriately enough, is called Rugby. And this man's name is William Webb Ellis. And looking at that picture, you might think he looks a little bit like a school teacher. And indeed, when this picture was made, William Webb Ellis was a school teacher. But we want to look a little bit further back, back when William Webb Ellis was a boy. And we're going to go to that town of rugby. And in particular, we're going to go to a school. Because you see, rugby, alongside Eton and Harrow, is one of the most famous boarding schools that you could find in England where the wealthy would send their children to receive an education. And one of the things that connected all of these boarding schools is they needed to do things to entertain their pupils. Now, archery had sort of fallen out of popularity, so they used team sports. Here we can see an image of the Eton game. Now, this photo looks fairly modern, and it is. It was actually taken in the 1990s, because the Eton game is a sort of football sport that is still played in the School of Eton today. In fact, all of the boarding schools in England had their own variation of football, and each of these sports had slightly different rules. In general, the main rule was you can only move forward by kicking the ball. You can't run with it. But different schools had different interpretations, and way back in 1823, at that school in rugby, one young boy thought outside the box and changed the game. And I think you can probably guess who that boy is going to be. So let me show you a short video clip. Gentlemen, this is not the classroom. There is no formula and there is no curriculum. We are here to express ourselves and to enjoy ourselves. And we do so together as a team. And we will fight and strain every sinew in our body, but we do so like men with honor and courage. And you will put the team first but you will find a way to make your mark and do your duty. You must have courage and commitment and character. Should responsibility make you timid? No! no. And should discipline clip your wings? No! no. So let's go!
です。KK、KK。What are you doing, Alice? Alice, put it down. What's he doing? Don't worry, Johnny. That will never take off. Okay. Some of you um, might have recognised um, Prince Harry at the end of that clip. Prince Harry um, is quite an avid player of rugby, or at least he was when he was still at school. Um, I always find it fascinating when we're talking about the history of rugby, and in particular the history of English sport, how in 1986, when someone handled a football in a, in a game, the English fans got very, very upset and wanted him to be banned for a long time. Whereas 160 years earlier, when a small boy did it, we ended up giving him his own statue. So things obviously change over the years. Now, at school, at all the different boarding schools, they continued to play their variations of their different sports. Some of them played a variation of football, some of them played a variation of rugby, but quite often the two sports mixed together. That was until the Great Divide. In 1963, the Football Association of England officially codified or formalized their rules and they banned running with the ball in hand. They also banned um, kicking players in the shins or the legs, but that wasn't considered to be as important a law. Now, this rule caused a big divide between those who agreed with it and those who disagreed with it. Those who agreed with the new rule went on to form association football or soccer teams. The word soccer itself comes from that word association, whereas those who disagreed with the football associations, associations rules formed up the rugby football union. So thus, in 1863, we had the first big separation between football and rugby. So let's go back to the beginnings of rugby. In 1871, the Rugby Football Union was officially formed. So that was eight years after rugby was removed from association soccer. And that later that same year, the first international rugby match was played at Rayburn Place in Edinburgh between the teams of Scotland and England. Now, we don't have any photos of that actual match. So this is a drawing of the game. We do have our photos of the teams that took part. On the left-hand side, wearing the darker coloured tops, we've got the Scottish rugby team, whereas wearing their more famous white shirts, we can see the English team on the right. And believe it or not, these are actual photos of the teams competing in that very first rugby match. Now, some of you might recognise the name Rayburn Place. Perhaps you've visited at our, as, at our school in CS Edinburgh, because Rayburn Place is just about 15, 20 minutes walk from our school. And believe it or not, rugby is still played there to this day. So we have a photo, or we have a drawing from that very first match. And then we have a photo on the other side from a rugby match taking place at the same ground just last year. In fact, the home team um, at um, Rayburn Place are Edinburgh Ackies, and their team is nearly 140 years old. So rugby is still sticking with the traditions sticking with the heritage, but still going strong. Now, rugby started off between Scotland and England, but very quickly it expanded and Wales and Ireland joined to form the home nations. So the four British countries were the home nations, and that was where the initial international matches took place. But it also became very popular in the Southern Hemisphere. And by the year 1910, we saw Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa start to compete and tour at rugby. Now, some of you might be saying, a couple of those flags look a little bit strange. That's because the flag representing Ireland was there to represent the whole of Ireland, not just the North and not just the Republic, 
Rugby in Ireland is played by the whole country or by both countries. And the flag representing South Africa at the bottom, well, that was the old apartheid flag. And luckily that has been replaced by the rainbow nation that we currently know today. One thing you could say about rugby as it expanded, if a flag had the Union Jack on it, there was a good chance the country played rugby. Rugby also expanded into the Olympic Games. It took part in the Games, the second Games ever in Paris in 1900, where it was won perhaps by a surprising team. It wasn't any of the home nations. It wasn't one of the Southern Hemisphere sides. Instead, it was the host nation of France. In fact, rugby appeared in four different Olympic Games, 1900, 1908, 1920, and 1924. After 1924, it took a bit of a break from the Games because unfortunately, there was a slight pitch invasion after the final and the Olympic Committee decided they wanted nothing more to do with rugby. But before we move on from this slide, I want you to have a look at this picture in particular. This is taken from the French Olympic team of 1900. And this chap here, Constantine Henriquez, was the first ever person of color to compete in any Olympic Games at any sport. So rugby really was a sport that attracted people of all creeds and all countries. And it's something I'm very proud of, that rugby was the first sport to really open up at the Olympics. As a result of France's success in the Olympic Games, France were invited to join the home nations where they formed the Five Nations. And then nothing much happened for a long time. The Southern Hemisphere were happy to tour, the home nations in France were happy to play matches against each other, but we wanted rugby to grow and become a global sport. So in 1987, the first Rugby Union World Cup was held in New Zealand and 16 teams took part. And what I think is fascinating is that all six continents, with the exception of Antarctica, were represented. From Europe, you had England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales and France, and they were joined by Italy and Romania. From Asia, we had Japan. Japan have appeared in every single Rugby World Cup and rather, rather disappointingly, beat Scotland at the last one. From North America, we saw United States and Canada. From South America, we saw Argentina take part. And from um, Africa, we saw South Africa and Zimbabwe. So that's five of the continents so far. The final one, Oceania, we saw Australia, New Zealand, Tonga, and Fiji. So all six continents represented making a truly international event. And to put that in context, since 1986, there have been eight different football World Cups, and there have only been one World Cup in that time where all six continents are represented. So even though rugby is considered to be a niche sport compared to football, compared to soccer, it's actually been much better in having global representation. The first World Cup was not only hosted by New Zealand, it was won by New Zealand. And in fact, they're probably the most successful rugby team of all time, with the All Blacks, as they're known, having gone on to win it on three different occasions. It has really been dominated by the Southern Hemisphere, with the only exception being 2003, when England brought the World Cup home. Now, perhaps the most famous World Cup took place in 1995, in South Africa. It was the first post-apartheid sporting event that South Africa were allowed to take part in. And it is seen as one of those occasions that actually helped bring the entire country together. As Nelson Mandela, representing the new modern establishment, handed over the trophy to the captain Francois Pinar, who had been seen as a symbol of the white elite, the previous ruling class. And both of those men went onto that stage wearing the same famous green jersey, both with the number six on the back. If you ever get the chance to watch the movie Invictus, starring Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon, I really do recommend it. It's a, a very good movie 
that tells a really emotional story about a new country coming together. When we're looking at World Cups, there's another separation we can look at, and that's the separation between amateur and professional. Up until that World Cup in 1995, rugby was a completely amateur sport. Players were not paid at any level, at least not officially. There had always been some payments taking place under the table. So after the World Cup in 95 finished, rugby became fully professional and players were allowed to make it their full-time occupation. And that is another milestone in the history of rugby union. So what did professionalism do? Well, it allowed rugby to continue to expand. To the five nations, we added Italy to form the six nations, and our three southern hemisphere countries also added Argentina to form the rugby championships. So now we had 10 tier one superpowers in the sport of rugby. It continued to expand globally after that. In 2016, the most recent statistics I could find, there were more than three and a half million players registered worldwide playing rugby. There are over 180,000 clubs and perhaps most impressively, it's one of the fastest growing sports when it comes to women's sports. So it's really, again, continuing that idea that rugby union is reaching out to encompass everyone under its umbrella. If we look at the statistics, out of the 192 different countries in the world, there are only 17 of them who don't have at least one registered rugby club. And I'm going to be perfectly honest, they all have at least two registered rugby clubs, because if they just had one, that would be a little bit dull. So rugby, it really has become very much a global sport. So we've looked at what professionalism did to the sport of rugby. What has it done to the players? Well, rugby has always been seen as a sport that could allow people of all shapes and sizes to take part. Rugby union, I'm going to say it straight, is a game for players of all shapes and sizes. And those are the opening lines from one of the most famous rugby coaches, Warren Gatland. A rugby union team has got 15 players and the players are split into positions. So you have eight forwards and seven backs. Forwards tend to be larger, stronger players, and the backs tend to be faster and a little bit more skillful. But that's not always the case. To continue Warren Gatlin's statement, rugby union is a game for players of all shapes and sizes. You have the superstars and the fast guys who score the tries, but you also need the workhorses, the forwards, and the people who play all the other roles. Unless they work together as a team, then it's really going to affect the performance. Everyone's got to rely on everyone else. And that's something I really love about the game of rugby. You have sports such as football, which are team games, but individual star players can make a massive difference. In rugby, it doesn't really matter how good an individual player is, you need the whole team to function for that team to be successful. However, not everyone is as complimentary about the different types of player as Warren Gatland is. Um, Peter Fitzsimmons once said, forwards are the gnarled and scarred creatures who have the propensity for running into each other and bleeding all over each other. He also had something to say about backs as well. He said, rugby backs can be identified because they generally have clean jerseys. I'll let you make up your own mind as to what position you think Peter Fitzsimmons played. Professionalism has changed the player size. As now people were able to work full time on training pitches and in gyms, players started to bulk up and become bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Between 1973 and 2019, the size and shape of a rugby player changed dramatically. Perhaps the player who was most at the forefront of this was the New Zealand superstar, Jonah Lohman, who made his debut in the 1995 Rugby World Cup. And I'm going to let you see a very short clip of Lomo playing against England. 
Once again, Bashup has it for the fourth time. Pass out to Lomu. Underwood can't take. This is the big man, Lomu. He's still on his feet. Lomu could score. That's a great try for New Zealand. And here, what's that pass? It's not a very good pass. And well picked up by Lomu. Look at the power of the man. 118 kilograms. Six foot five. So there you have it, Jono Lumu, six foot five, 118 kilograms in weight. At the time regarded as an absolute monster of a man, believe it or not today, that's more or less the average size of most of the rugby players. So there has been a massive change in player size as a result of the professional game. So we have a look at the players, we have a look at the history, we probably need to know how do you play rugby? Well, You've got to take the ball from your end and score at the other end. And in rugby, the way you score is by placing the ball down, by touching it down over the opponent's line. Yes, unlike in American football, where a touchdown never needs to actually touch the ground, in rugby, you do have to get that ball onto the floor. We call this a try. In order to move forward, you can either run with the ball in your hand or you can kick it forward and chase after it. What you cannot do is throw the ball forward. If you want to throw the ball, then you have to throw it either in line or backwards. If the ball goes forward from your hands, you're going to lose possession. Scoring. So a try is worth five points, but this has not always been the case. In fact, believe it or not, a try used to be worth absolutely nothing. That's why it was called a try, because it allowed you to have a try at scoring by kicking the ball. If you kick a conversion, so kicking the ball from the ground between the posts, you get a bonus two points. You can also kick the ball in other times in rugby. A penalty is worth three points, and a drop goal, a very difficult piece of skill, dropping the ball on the ground so it bounces and then kicking it through the posts is also worth three points. Very technical, very difficult to do, but has been involved in some of the great moments of rugby history, and particular for English fans. Indeed, our London principal, David Morgan, has promised he would kill me if I didn't show you this clip of Johnny Wilkinson winning the World Cup for England in 2003. So there you go, three points and a World Cup. Drop goals can have a massive impact on the game. So the opposition have the ball, they've got it under their arm and they're running for you. How do you stop them? Well, luckily rugby is a contact sport. In fact, change that. I love this quotation. Ballroom dancing is a contact sport. Rugby is a collision sport. It's a sport where large people meet each other going at speed and you can hear it from quite a distance away. So let's have a look at a standard tackle and see if you can get why they call it a collision. Myla, PC, Bergen. What a hit. Oh, he's been penalised for not rolling away. I mean, look at this. Bang. I mean, Ken Prince is a powerful man. And he's absolutely dominated him. I think we can easily say that's more collision than contact. Perhaps one of the, the disappointing things is there has become a rise in the, the cult of the hit. As players have got bigger, there is more focus of being placed on the strength and the impact. And unfortunately, that does increase the, the likelihood of injury. What I will say, rugby is still considered one of the safest sports to play and the professional bodies are doing a lot now to make sure that tackles can be as safe as possible. I think there was only going to be one winner in that situation.
But how can we keep it fair? How can we make sure that um, both the tackler and the tackle are protected? Well, you could ask people to um, police it themselves. After all, rugby, according to Winston Churchill, is a hooligans game played by gentlemen. But you probably do need some, some regulations. It might surprise you then if I tell you that rugby union has no rules. Absolutely true. There is not one rule in the whole game of rugby union. Instead, we do have 22 laws, which can be found in the rugby law book. Most of these involve our own contact, in particular in the tackle. To make sure things are safe, your tackle must be below the shoulder. So you can only really tackle someone within this green box. This means we're minimizing head contact and head collision. The tackler must wrap his arms around the ball carrier to prevent shoulder charges. And again, make sure that contact is taking place with control and with respect. And finally, very importantly, you're not allowed to bring the legs of the ball carrier above the horizontal because then he's going to go head first. So even though it is a collision sport, there's a lot of regulation to make sure it's safe and competitive. And who's in charge? Well, players will quite often tell you it's them, but really it's the referee. Law one in the game of rugby, the referee is the sole judge of fact and law during a match. But he doesn't need to do it alone. A referee will normally be helped out by two assistant referees. And depending on the level of the game, those referees will all be mic'd up so they can communicate with each other during the match and make sure they get the right decision. But if they disagree with each other, the final decision always rests with the referee on the pitch. If we need any more help, well, if you're a football fan, you might know and hate the letters VAR. That's the video referee that has been introduced to football in the past couple of years. In rugby, we don't have the VAR. Instead, we have the TMO, the Television Match Official, and that's been part of the rugby game since 2001. And it's used to, to make sure we get those critical decisions right. And one of the good things about rugby is they've actually got the communication between referee and TMO down to a science. I'm going to show you a clip, and I want you to just to count in your head how long it takes the referee to get a decision from the TMO after the try is scored. Now, your counting may be slightly different to mine, but I made that 24 seconds. So 24 seconds from the referee blowing his whistle to the correct decision being made. To compare that to the FIFA World Cup in 2018, the average VR decision took over four minutes. So advice and help from video referees can be useful. We just need to make sure we get it done quickly and accurately. We couldn't talk about rugby referees without mentioning this man, Nigel Owens, who is probably regarded as the greatest referee in rugby history. He's certainly the most famous. He started refereeing back in 1987 in his native country of Wales, and he refereed his first international match in 2003. Since that time, he's refereed 76 different international matches. That's included the Rugby World Cup four times and the Rugby World Cup final in 2015. He really is a fabulous referee, and one of the reasons he's become so popular and so famous is his ways of dealing with players. I'm going to show you a clip of perhaps his most famous interaction. The law is quite clear. The mall is formed, held up, unplayable, turn of a ball, no issues whatsoever. I don't think we've met before, but I'm the referee on this field, not you. Stick to your job and I will do mine. If I hear you shouting for anything again, I'm going to be penalising you. This is not soccer. Is that clear? Back you go and get on it again. That told him. Yeah, Nigel Owen's famous line, this is not soccer. I think there's two things that really come across clearly in that clip. The first is the respect that the players have for the referee. And the second is the fact we can actually hear the referee at all. In international and professional matches, all referees are mic'd up so that the television audience 
in listening to what the referee is saying to players. This was something they trialed back in football in the English Premiership about six years ago. Unfortunately, the language used was so much that they had to turn the referee's mic off at half time. So refereeing in rugby is certainly a more pleasant experience and you probably learn a few less adjectives than you do while refereeing football. So we're going to finish up very quickly by having a look at the future, both positive and negative. If we look at the negative first, as players get bigger, the risk of injuries and concussion is going to continue to increase. And this is definitely something the Rugby Football Union and the International Rugby Board have to pay really close attention to. Rugby is a great sport, but unless we can maintain its safety, you're going to lose players. The positives is that Rugby Sevens, a quick, fast game of rugby, has now made its way into the Olympic Games and the numbers of playing rugby are increasing year on year. In fact, rugby is probably in its best position it ever has been. So that's my um, talk about rugby. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in, which I will answer. Um, yeah, so Vlad, that clip we saw between Ireland and Scotland, that was from the Aviva Stadium, which you can find in Ireland. Um, previously, most rugby teams played at football grounds but there have been a lot of great international rugby stadiums developed. Here in Edinburgh, we have a 67,000 seater called Murrayfield, which is, I think, the fifth biggest sports stadium in the UK. Absolutely fabulous and great, great destination. Um, okay, someone's asking, do I think that professionalism is a good or a bad thing? I'm sure the players will tell you it's a good thing because they're now able to, to earn a living playing the sport they, they, they love. I think professionalism always has downsides because it has changed the game. And I think you now have a separation between amateur and professional rugby that is far greater than the separation between amateur and professional football. Um, but I think unless it officially became professional, you're always going to find ways to get around it. So professionalism was inevitable. And I'll just take one more question because I realize this has been quite a, a long talk today. Um, what age can you play rugby? So the, the answer to that is rugby tots, um, which, is, um, a, which is something that has been introduced into the UK. That's um, teaching people basic rugby skills from the age of five. So that'll be running, passing, a little bit of kicking. Tackling isn't introduced till much later on. In fact, in the Southern Hemisphere, in places like New Zealand, um, you won't have tackling involved until people are 12, 13, 14 years old. So you introduce the different stages of rugby slowly because there are some aspects that you don't want players to get involved with until they are stronger. Um, and Vlad is asking, do I play rugby? Um, yes, well, I used to play rugby. I played rugby for about 15 years. But I took um, one too many head knocks and I decided it was better to become a referee than a player. Although I, I, I do miss it. And I'll let you make up your own mind whether I used to play in the backs or in the forwards. But either way, I wasn't very good, but I had fun. So um, I think I'm going to, to finish up the talk there. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions, you can send them to me at my email address, which is jcocaine at cs-schools.com. And you can also um, ask any questions on the YouTube or Instagram pages of what, as well, which are both at CS Schools. Um, for me, rugby is an absolutely fabulous sport. If you get the chance to play it, it's a sport that promotes teamwork above all others. And it is a sport that has a position for everyone. If you're visiting the UK, go along, watch a match. Doesn't need to be an international game. Go and watch a local club side taking part. Um, shout encouragement. Just don't shout at the referee. They're just trying to do their job. So I hope you've enjoyed that. 
Um, next week, it's a, a bumper week uh, chess talk because we've got two talks for you taking place on Wednesday. And um, both of them are about music because we're celebrating Music Week um, at Centre of English Studies. At three o'clock in the afternoon, British time, David will be talking to you about British music. And later on that evening, seven o'clock UK time or two o'clock Canadian time, Sheila is going to be telling you all about Canadian music. So really excited with what's going to happen then. So from me in Edinburgh, thank you very much for listening. Have a great week and cheers for now.